Thank you for sharing that beautiful, special music with us. It's a wonderful reminder that God sees us. He's watching over us. Amen? It's wonderful to be reminded of that. It's wonderful to be here with you guys today. My wife, Christina, and I had the opportunity to pastor here, and it's been almost two years since we've been here. Although I was, I was sitting here in this pew, it feels like it's been about four months. <laughs> um, so it's what a joy to be back here uh, to see many familiar faces, and I can't wait to meet some of the rest of you uh, afterwards at Fellowship Mill, hopefully. So uh, once again, we're glad that you're able to be here today, and um, we're, it's a joy for us to join with you. I was going to share a story I heard recently. Uh, it's a story of a, of a young father who was trying to rush out the door, and maybe as a young father myself, I could find myself relating to it. Uh, he was busy trying to get to work, and after trying to change his, his youngest child's diaper and getting dirty himself through the process, had to change his clothes, was late to an important meeting, and so was heading out the door. But as he was heading out the door, he almost tripped over his older daughter, who said, looked, looking up to him, he said, she said, Daddy, can you help me get my rain boots on? Well, he was busy. He didn't have a lot of time to spare to try to work with this child. But one looked back at his wife and he realized he better help his daughter. <laughs> so he took the time and he, he, he spent, bent over to try to help his daughter get these rain boots on. And man, it was hard. He could understand why she needed some help. He, he pushed and he pulled and he shoved and got these little plastic rain boots on her feet. And finally, after doing that, he... Uh, patted her on the head and turned towards the door, but she, she, she shouted out, Daddy, Daddy, they're on the wrong feet. <laughs> He's pretty frustrated, but once again, looking at the wife, he knew that he should probably help the older daughter, and so he, he, he went down and, and once again realized it was even harder to get the, the shoes off than on, but yanked these boots off finally, turned them around, got them on the right feet, put them back on again, and breathed heavily before walking out the door again. But as he was just reaching his hand for the handle, he heard his daughter once again say, Daddy, these aren't my boots. But they're not your boots. He turned to the daughter and said, Yeah, m Mommy got me these boots for my birthday. They're, they're not mine yet. And she said, Oh, this is unbelievable. So he bent over again, grabbed the boots, started pulling them off. Again, took minutes. Finally yanked them off. And he said, okay, I love you, honey, as he was getting ready to go. And he said, well, the daughter looked at him and said, daddy, well, they're not my boots um, yet, but mommy got them for my birthday, and she told me to wear them whenever it's raining. Can you help me put them back on? And the dad said, what? You are kidding me. He looked back at the wife. The wife confirmed that this was indeed true. So he thought, okay, last time. He reached down, put on the boots one final time. He was definitely late by this point and was very frustrated. He reached for the door and as he was just getting ready to go, he realized, ah, his keys, his car keys. So he shouted out, has anyone seen my car keys? To which his little daughter replied, yeah, dad, they're in the toe of my boots. <laughs> <sighs> I share this story with you because that about sums up the last two years for my wife and I. It's hard sometimes having grace in the midst of chaos, whether it's the chaos of a growing family whether it's the chaos of any stage of life, finding grace in the midst of chaos can be difficult. This morning, I want to talk about finding grace in the midst of chaos. I, I want to fi talk about finding grace in the midst of failures in our lives. And so for that reason, this morning, we're going to look at a difficult story in Scripture. In fact, a very difficult story. It's one of those stories that, if we're honest, we kind of wish wasn't in the Bible at all. The reason, though, that I have to say from the, from the beginning, the reason we're looking at this story today, a story that we often like to ignore, is that I believe that if we can find grace in this story, then maybe we can believe that there's room for grace in our lives as well. Amen? And so this morning, that's what we're going to do. Before we turn to this story, though, I want to invite you to bow your heads just one more time to ask God's Spirit to be with us. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, before we open up your word this morning, would you please send your Spirit? Father, we're looking at a hard story. It can bring lots of different emotions, Lord, but we pray that through this process, we see a clearer picture of you. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 
you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 11. Judges, chapter 11. I appreciate the scripture reading this morning. It set the stage for us as we turn here in Judges, chapter 11. I'll be reading from the New International Version, but I'm happy for you to follow along whatever version you have this morning. We're reading Judges, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, and it says this. Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead, and his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get our inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. Verse 3. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tov, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Life can be cruel. And it was for this man named Jephthah. He entered the world as a stigma, born in an illegitimate relationship out of that. The few verses that we have about his early life is that it was hard. It was not an easy life, and it took a turn for the worse. Apparently, the father had some ownership over him, but as soon as his brothers grew up, they chased him away, chased him out of town, said, you're not getting any of our inheritance. And so he was forced to leave and go to the land of Tov which a literal translation from the Hebrew is the good land. That's what it means. And yet, it's easy to imagine that for Jephthah, life was anything but good. It was difficult. And the only way that he could find a way to survive is that he gathered a group of bandits around him to go out and be mercenaries for hire, perhaps, or maybe just thieves. We're not sure which it is. But he had a rough life. Thankfully, He was offered the chance at redeeming a life taken from him. We find it as we read on. Judges 11, verse 4. It says, Some time later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? (laughs) He asked the question, but the reality was, this was it. This was his chance at redemption. And as luck would have it, it hinged on something he was good at, war. He was good at fighting. And so as the conversation continued in the, in the verses, he said, listen, I'll help you fight these guys. But if you do that, you need to make, if I do it, you need to make me your leader. And so after a little bit of a back and forth, he made sure that they were telling the truth. They said, sure. If you help deliver us from this enemy, we'll make you the leader. He was excited, and he went to work right away. He agreed to help them. And so he sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites, the the attacking army, to seek a peaceful solution. And we can see it in verse 12 when it says, Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against me that you have attacked my country? The pagan king refused to back down because he claimed the land belonged to the Ammonites. And in verses 14 to 22, we'll skip over them because of time, but Jephthah went into this monologue explaining to the king, and he he has displayed an impressive knowledge of Israel's history where he shared with them that it wasn't the Ammonites' land in the first place, but the Amorites, a different people group. And the only reason that Israel had taken the land from the Amorites is because the Amorites had attacked the Israelites, not the other way around. Essentially, Jephthah was telling him, you're fighting for something that was never yours in the first place. He tried to seek a peaceful solution, but the king wouldn't have it. An important part, though, we find in Judges chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, in the midst of his persuasive speech, where he's trying to barter for peace, He tells the king of the Ammonites, he says, now, in verse 23, now since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God Chemosh gives you? That was one of the local pagan deities. He continues on, likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Then jumping to verse 27, he says, I have not wronged you, but you are doing wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. Well, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on here. It seems as though Jephthah's faith is a little off. 
Perhaps he believed in multiple gods by referencing the god Chemosh. We don't know what's going on. It wouldn't be hard to believe that. After all, this story takes place during the period of the judges where Israel as an entire nation was not doing very well with their theological beliefs. And it's easy to believe that someone like Jephthah, who grew up on the theological fringes of society, would possibly have some, some incorrect views of what it meant to follow the Lord God. But I, did you guys catch this important part? Ultimately, Jephthah threw in his lot with God. He said, let the Lord God decide. Let him be the judge. In saying that, Jephthah united himself with God's mission. He joined forces with God. He had faith in the Lord God. And so despite the likelihood that Jephthah had a faith in God tainted by paganism, his faith was so memorable that he made it into the list of God's faithful followers in Hebrews 11. We're familiar with that chapter, right? We call it the what chapter? The faith chapter, that's exactly right. The hall of heroes sometimes is what we call it, where we find the, the, the best of the best of God's faithful. And in Hebrews eleven thirty two, I'm going to turn there just very briefly. It says, what more shall I say, as Paul is writing the book of Hebrews. He says, I do not have time to talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. It, it goes on, but as a matter of interest, Jephthah is included as a person of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He had faith in God, even though he may not have fully understood everything that's going on. And so with that faith in God there, we continue the story. Judges chapter 11, verse 29. And it says this, after the king of Ammon uh, disagreed to not have peace, verse 29 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. Jephthah had faith that God would win this battle, but for some reason, a reason perhaps we'll never be able to fully understand, verses 30 and 31, he made a note. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, Verse 31, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Anyone who's seen a child be potty trained can perhaps relate a little bit perhaps to what's going on in Jephthah's mind. I remember when we were potty training our, our eldest daughter, Ella, we got to the point where we realized that we didn't doubt that she could make it to the bathroom on time. It was just if she would. <laughs> and so to try to sweeten the deal for her, we found that her favorite thing was a piece of chewing gum. And so we would try to say, Ella, listen, if, if you make it to the potty in time, we'll give you some chewing gum. Once again, trying to encourage her, not because we didn't think she could do it, but wanting to make sure that she would do it. It's the best that I can come up with. It seems like that's what Jeff is doing here with God. It doesn't seem as though Jephthah doubts that God could win this battle, but it would be easy to see how someone like Jephthah, someone who had been cast aside his whole life, would perhaps question if he was valuable enough for God to help him. And so he makes this vow likely not because he doubted that God could save them, but he wanted to make sure that God would save him. He makes the vow, and with the vow uttered, the battles began Verse 32 is, is short but sweet as it simply says, Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. God delivered his people. God brought victory where defeat was in store. God saved them. And so you can imagine what joy filled the air as Jephthah and his warriors started making their way back to their hometown. And you can just picture them passing through the little villages, hearing people sing and shout and praise God and perhaps praise them. Such, so much joy and gladness. The Bible doesn't hint at whether or not he was thinking about his vow as he approached home, but it does reveal that as he arrived there, he was met with a shock. And it's these last verses of the story, you guys likely know what's coming, that are so hard to understand that I'm simply going to read them instead of telling the story. Starting in verse 34, when Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? 
She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I'm devastated. I've made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. Verse 36. My father, she replied, you've given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed. She was a virgin. We'll we'll end the verse there. It's a hard story. It's an enraging story. And it's a... It's a story that has bitter irony with it. We see in this story a a person who was cast aside in life, Jephthah. And he had the chance at redemption to be part of his family once again, to be reunited with those who had sent him away. He wanted this redemption so bad that he was willing to give everything he had for it. But when he returned from battle, The writer of Judges adds just enough detail for us to know, to to understand this picture that Jephthah already had a family that loved him. He was already a hero to one little girl. He was a daddy, and in his request for redemption, he gave everything for nothing. Sure, he was made a leader of a people, but a people who didn't love him. Sure, maybe his inheritance was reinstated, but the person who seemed to love him the most was the price he needlessly chose to pay in his quest for redemption. He gave everything for nothing. And the added sting is that he didn't have to do that. God never asked him to make that sacrifice. But he was so set on his goal that he was recklessly willing to sacrifice anything or anyone for his goal. Now, there's been a long history of attempting to reinterpret this story, and I I don't blame those attempts. After all, it's a troubling story. There are many who've, who've wondered, perhaps, if what the story is really saying is that perhaps Jephthah just dedicated his young daughter to serve in the temple, much like the little boy Samuel. And this story stings enough that I'm not going to spend a lot of time debunking that escape hatch from the horrific ending. But to be most honest with the text, it's fair to acknowledge just two short points. First, as we read this story, chapter 11, verse 1, lets us know that Jephthah's mother was a prostitute. In Deuteronomy, the the book of the law, Deuteronomy 23, 2 says that No one born of a forbidden marriage, which that would be a case of that, nor any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the 10th generation. Unfortunately, what that lets us know is that not only was Jephthah disqualified from ever even stepping foot in the sanctuary, the tabernacle, but nine generations after him would be forbidden. So the idea that one of his children could have been dedicated to serve the Lord like little Samuel just does not seem to match up with the reality of what could happen in their situation. Second, the text of Judges 11.39 seems at its basic and most likely reading it to simply mean what it says. Jephthah sacrificed his daughter. That said, for this morning, let's agree on this. Either way, you look at it. Jephthah's oath was needless, reckless, forfeited his lineage, and put the burden of payment on someone else besides himself. He didn't have to do it, but he did. The bitterness of this story begs a question of us, I believe. What do your actions show that you are willing to give everything for? What are you sacrificing? The story of Jephthah leaves a pivotal question for us to ponder. Am I, through neglect, unintentionally sacrificing my relationship with my kids? My relationship with my spouse, my, my relationship with others who are important to me, perhaps my relationship with God. We loathe Jephthah for making a sacrifice not required of him, but how often do we do the same thing? This is a hard story, 
And I share it with you today because I believe we can learn something from God's grace from it. If we can find grace in a story like this, maybe we can believe that there's room for grace in our stories as well. So where's the grace? Let's look for it. Where's the hope for anyone who's realized their need of grace? You know, as I was studying this passage, the recurring anthem in my heart was, I hate this story. I hate it. It was only later that the thought harmonized with my refrain that God probably hates this story too. Which is important to understand because some individuals have advocated that God blessed Jephthah with a victory because of his rash vow and that Jephthah proved his faith to God by following through with the vow. The story does state that God's spirit came upon Jephthah and that God was the source of his victory. And as we've seen, Hebrews 11 also commends Jephthah for being a person of faith. So first, as we look for grace, it's important to set right our view of God. The Bible makes it clear that God abhors what Jephthah did. Deuteronomy 18.10 is indicative of numerous other texts when it says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft. It goes on. The text makes it clear. God was not pleased with what Jephthah did. Moreover, rather than fulfilling his vow, showing that he had faith in God, Jephthah's vow in general was the opposite of faith. God asks for our faith to be in what he provides for us, amen? And in short, to have faith in his grace. Jephthah apparently had faith in God's power, but not in God's willingness to bless his people with a military victory. So it's hard to view Jephthah's vow as anything more than bargaining for grace. And if there's one thing we learn through scripture, we can't bargain for what God has given freely. Jephthah's bargaining was unnecessary and didn't change God's mind. God was committed to helping Israel survive not because of Jephthah's vow or sacrifice, but because of it, I mean, despite of it. So there is no honor in Jephthah keeping his vow. Instead, whether he realized it or not, Jephthah's actions were side-aligning God's grace. So we ask again, where's the grace in this story? Jephthah is commended for his faith in Hebrews 11, but it's important to remember that no one mentioned in Hebrews 11 is there because their lives were perfect. God often chooses to work through our brokenness, which brings about blessings. In the same passage in Hebrews that Jephthah is mentioned is another person of faith as an example, the person uh, Samson. Samson, a person who's celebrated for his strength. The Bible makes it clear that Samson's strength was a gift from who? From God. And we'll know, I know you guys know this story well enough to remember with me, that Samson kept that gift, that act of God's divine favor upon him, he kept that gift of strength even as he disobeyed his parents, murdered, desecrated his vows, and had numerous relationships outside of God's will. Throughout all of those things, in God's grace, he let his blessing remain on Samson. And as you look through the list of faithful people, you realize that Samson, along with most others on that list, was included as a person of faith, not for the acts of disobedience, but despite those acts. These were not perfect people. The same is true of Jephthah. He was counted as a person of faith, not because of his vow or fulfillment of it, but despite of it. And it's right here, right at this point where we begin to see where the grace is in this story. Despite Jephthah's difficult life, despite the horrible decisions that he made, despite his challenges with accepting the free gift of God's victory, God chose to remember Jephthah as a person of faith. God chose to remember Jephthah at his best moment, not his worst. He chose to remember Jephthah for the faith he did have, not for the faith he didn't have. And God can do the same for you. You see, God was able to remember Jephthah at his best because Jesus would pay for him at his worst. Jesus was a sacrifice provided not only for Jephthah's mistakes, but for all of ours as well. 1 John 2, 2 states, 
that he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also those of the whole world. Jesus died for us so that we could find healing for our wounds. Jesus died for us so that the worst and best parts of us could be buried and forgiven in him. Jesus died for us so that when his father, God, looks at us as we limp through life, he sees only the parts of us that reflect his son, Jesus. Amen? Amen. There is much grace to be found in a story like this, a story that reminds us that God gave everything, even his own son, for us. The question remains is this, did God give everything for nothing? It's a question he's waiting for all of us to answer. See, there's no good thing he's withheld from us. He gave everything for you and for me to have the chance to find redemption. But did he give everything for nothing? You see, until we accept that grace anew, afresh daily, our answer to God's sacrifice is, God, your everything means nothing to me. The reality is, is that many of us likely have moments where we realize that we, like Jephthah, have sacrificed something God didn't ask for. Maybe we chose to focus on one area of our life instead of another, and we regret it. Maybe you've experienced moments of failure as a parent. Maybe you've experienced moments of failure as a husband, a wife, an employer, a child, a friend. Maybe you feel like you failed as a child of God. Maybe you've sacrificed your innocence for gain, your purity for pleasure your home for a house, whatever it is, our failures hurt. So in the midst of our failures, may we be reminded of the grace our God offers us. May we realize that we serve a God capable of remembering us at the times of our greatest faith instead of our greatest failure. I'm eternally grateful for a God like this. Maybe you found yourself pursuing a direction in life that is causing you to sacrifice something God hasn't asked of you. Please know there's much grace available for you today. God is more interested in remembering your faith than remembering your failures. If you've made mistakes, don't let them keep you from God. Don't let your failures keep him away from you. He loves you and wants to redeem you. He's given everything for you. Will you accept? When I think of the great love that God has for us, the grace that he's given us, I'm reminded of one of my favorite stories that that came out of World War II. As many of you guys know, World War II was full of much tragedy, and yet some of the most amazing examples of courage also came from it. And so a story that touches my heart is the story of a young man named Jerzy, who was a Polish resistance fighter against the Nazi regime. He was working to try to infiltrate and and suppress that oppressive power. But in the midst of doing that, he was captured by the Nazis and put into a concentration camp, Auschwitz. A very difficult place, as you know, where being sentenced there was often a death sentence. Jersey found himself in this concentration camp, and he was forced to to do hard manual labor. And, And so it's an unlikely setting, but... As he was there working in a grain silo, one day as he was working there, he looked up and there was a young lady who was working beside him and he thought he caught her winking at him. In the midst of of sadness, tragedy, and death, Jersey looked up and he saw a pretty girl and he said, I got to get to know this girl. And so he went and he talked to her. Turns out she had not winked at him. She had dust in her eye, but her name was Sila. And in the most unlikely of all places, a relationship started between them. Love found room to bloom. And it was not long afterwards that Jersey said, Sila, I'm going to get you out of here. That's what he dedicated his life to. For eight months, Jersey began to work on an escape plan to get Sila out of that place. And so he would go at night and sneak into the warehouses and he would get scraps of material, and he began painstakingly sewing together a Nazi guard uniform. He began forging documents that would say that they could leave the prison. The plan was simple. He would pretend to be a guard, 
take Sila out, and many of the prisoners were allowed to go outside and work in farms during the day and then come back at night. So that was his plan. He forged documents saying that that was supposed to happen to Sila. For eight months, he worked on this plan, and finally the day came. He put on his, his guard uniform, tried to, to look like he was well-fed for once, cleaned himself up, put his uniform on, and confidently walked to Sila's barracks, sternly grabbed her, acting like a guard, and roughly walked her to the very front door of the prison. You can imagine the fear they must have had as he, as he approached those guards, and perhaps with a hand trembling just a little bit, handed the forged documents. It worked. They opened the doors and they escaped Auschwitz and they began running for days until they finally felt like they could stop running. Jersey found a safe place for Sila and she was okay. But he said, listen, you're not safe forever. I'm going to go back and continue to fight this war. Until this, this ends, you're never going to be safe. So he left Sila where she could be, and he went off to fight the war. And the war ended. But Sila didn't hear from Jersey. A year passed, and then another. No word. And finally, Sila realized that she had to accept that the one who had rescued her had died, and she could, had to continue on with her life. Years went by. Sila found herself living in North America. And one day in passing, Sila mentioned the story of her escape to a cleaner, a house cleaner. The year was 1983. And as she was talking to her house cleaner, the house cleaner happened to be Polish. And she said, wait a second. Sila, I've heard that story before. I just heard that on TV like last week. She said, no, no, I, I don't think that would be on TV. She said, yeah, I just heard that. In fact, they were interviewing a guy named Jersey. Jersey is alive. It was incredible. So, so they, they called this TV station, and sure enough, Jersey had survived all those years. It's just communication had broken down so much after the war that they couldn't get connected again. He was alive all of these years later, and so they made plans to meet up again. Jersey was overwhelmed to hear that Sila was doing well, so he purchased 39 roses, one for every year that they had been apart. And flew across the ocean to meet her. And he approached her, her place where she lived and knocked on the door. And as she opened the door, they were both overjoyed to be reunited. It's a beautiful story. But can you imagine the heartache that Jersey would have felt if after those 39 years of being apart, after risking so much to save the one that he loved, if he approached her door, knocked on it, and no one answered. Now, maybe she didn't hear. Perhaps he would straighten his tie and knock again. But what if she never came? What if she never came for the one who had risked so much to give her life? The Bible describes Jesus as standing at the door of our hearts, knocking. So desperately wanting us to accept the grace that he has. He's risked everything for us to give us a new life, to give us freedom. But the question today is, will we accept that grace in him? If you'd like to accept that grace, I want to invite you to simply bow your heads as we have a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to provide grace for us. Lord, we're reminded today that many of us need your grace Thank you for showing that you, Lord, are willing to remember us at the moments of our greatest faith, not our least faith. I just ask a special blessing for each person here. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In your name, amen. amen. This time we want to invite you to sing our closing song, Holy Thine, hymn 308. <laughs>